Located in St. Louis, west of the Mississippi River and just north of the Gateway Arch, the Wendell L. Pruitt Homes and William Igo Apartments, Pruitt Igo for short, occupied what was originally known as DeSoto Car, a then deteriorating neighborhood. The implementation of urban renewal policies in St. Louis, specifically through the construction of the Pruitt Igo Homes, demonstrates the social, political, and economic significance of urban renewal nationally because the failure of this project shows how poorly planned urban renewal programs even when supported by local politicians and federal capital, can lead to economic failures with negative impacts on the lives of many. The project was originally heralded as a revolutionary project, one which would bring quality, affordable housing into what was deemed a blighted community. But sadly, this prediction couldn't have been further from the truth. The Housing Act of 1949 proclaimed that the general welfare and security of the nation and the health and living standards of its people require housing production as well as stating that clearing inadequate housing or the clearance of slums and blighted areas, with a broad definition of these terms, was necessary. Thus, under this new law, the St. Louis Land Clearance and Redevelopment Authority, an already established authority now authorized to take greater action, seized DeSoto Car and began the redevelopment. DeSoto Car was generally considered the worst example of St. Louis's housing and development crisis in the 1940s. In this region, the city faced the epitome of what was generally considered blight, measured by substandard housing in neighborhoods. The situation was so grim, in fact, that the city was one of four in the nation losing population. Metropolitan population, as a percentage of total population, dropped by nearly 30 points between 1900 and 1950. Additionally, 33,000 homes in the city shared toilets and over 80,000 lived in buildings originating in the 19th century. As a result of these conditions and through the Housing Act of 1949, St. Louis received a great deal of funding. It qualified for this funding as it required slum clearance, urban redevelopment, and public housing. By 1950, St. Louis was guaranteed funding for 5,800 public housing units, over half of which would be a part of pruitt Igo. This was a large investment, yet constraints of the Public Housing Act kept expenses to a bare minimum. The master plans of this project were created by Minoru Yamasaki. His planned project covered 57 acres of land with 2,870 apartment units housing up to 10,000 individuals. The city opted for identical buildings as a method of cutting costs, rather than Yamasaki's original plan, which included buildings of various size. As a result, his project was exceedingly bland, as all the large concrete buildings were exactly alike. Other cost-saving features were forced upon his plan, such as skip-stop elevators that only stopped at every third floor and a general lack of landscaping. The final plan, which was eventually implemented, consisted mainly of identical buildings. Thirty-three 11-story tall concrete structures referred to as pruitt Igo, or the Wendell O. Pruitt Homes and William Igo Apartments. Thus, these 33 great monoliths of modern design were erected. Bulldozing of DeSoto Car began in 1951. The pruitt Igo housing project was completed in, in late 1954, after the black slum of 515 homes, 362 of which had no indoor plumbing and 131 of which had no running water, was demolished. The construction of the project cost approximately $50 million, roughly equal to the then current price for an equal number of three-bedroom ranch houses in suburban St. Louis. Because the costs of the projects were cut to a bare-bone minimum, the cheaply constructed interiors hid behind a facade of a modern and up-to-date appearance. The interiors were described as follows. The quality of the hardware was so poor that doorknobs and locks were broken on initial use. Window panes were blown from inadequate frames by wind pressure. In the kitchens, cabinets were made of the thinnest plywood possible. The new housing complex was originally intended to be segregated and occupied by lower-middle-class black and white people. But when St. Louis Housing Authority apartments became desegregated in 1956, the population became more and more black. In fact, the project appears to have been predominantly black from the beginning, when it still housed 10,000 individuals, 98% of them were black. The project was envisioned as replacing a black neighborhood with a black and white community which would still be segregated and therefore not very progressive. Yet, segregation on a greater citywide scale was reinforced within a few years as the community became predominantly black because of lack of white interest in sharing homes with minorities. As vacancies increased and the housing became less desirable, the only people living there were those who couldn't afford to move. Thus, they did not have a positive economic effect. They came in search of work which couldn't be found, 
and essential building maintenance paid for by modest rental fees drawn from an ever smaller and more impoverished group of tenants ended up deferred and ultimately denied. Thus, the Pruitt-Igo housing development not only failed to revitalize the area economically, but also failed to bring in enough money to sustain itself. Only a short time after they were constructed and inhabited, the quality of living in the entire housing project started to deteriorate. For example, multiple features first considered architectural marvels became dangerous and unnecessary, such as the elevators which only reached certain floors. Additionally, a great deal of vacancies increasing exponentially within the buildings showed how undesirable of a location they really were, though inexpensive. There have been many criticisms of the physical layout and how that could have influenced the failure of the project. For example, in an article on architecture and morality from The Ecologist, George Marshall writes that it had been an act of intolerable intellectual aggression on the part of the architect, Minoru Yamasaki, to think that low-income families could be housed in faceless brick barracks of such unrelenting monotony. In another article published by the New Republic, it is suggested that modern architecture is an abstraction that failed to meet practical human needs, and that this affliction caused the authorities in St. Louis to blow Pruitt-Igo up. The appearance of the buildings are certainly drab and in a way overwhelming, yet to place blame on the architecture alone is a mistake. Shortly after the project was built, there was a lack of demand for public housing such as pruitt It wasn't simply the fact that it was a large building, it was the fact that it wasn't a home. Desegregation led to white flight to the suburbs, which opened housing to migrant workers, a majority of which were minorities. As more minorities moved in, more whites left. Thus, the post-war housing crisis was greatly reduced and pruitt now had a housing crisis of its own. By 1957, 9% of the units were empty. By 1960, 16% were empty. And by 1965, it was 65% empty, as compared to a citywide average of 8% vacancy in public housing. Less and less individuals remained, and so only the poorest stayed. As a result, the building slowly deteriorated and became a hotbed for crime and organized gangs. The plans for redevelopment relied upon a continually growing city, but the reality was that, as whites fled the city in search of better employment and housing opportunities, cities lost still more wages and tax base, and struggled to support an increasingly poor and elderly population with fewer and fewer resources. In 1965, after requesting federal money for seven years, there was an attempt to save pruitt via an influx of cash that sought to put in place some of Yamasaki's original more luxurious features. Yet by that time, it was too late. In 1971, only 600 residents remained, and between 1972 and 1975, the entire project was demolished. For a period of time, the entire space on which pruitt used to lie stayed abandoned and overgrown. Today, a portion of the land is occupied by the Gateway Schools Complex, originally constructed in 1995. The rest, another 33 acres, remains undeveloped, though some original buildings, paved areas, curbs, and sidewalks remain. The site is surrounded to the west and north by single and multi-family dwellings largely built in the late 19th and 20th centuries, and on the other two sides by new concrete warehouses. And so, pruitt leaves St. Louis with few physical reminders of its presence, but provides a legacy of one of the greatest urban redevelopment and public housing failures. Undoubtedly a disappointing legacy, but one that can and must be learned from. The failure of this public housing project is of course an American tragedy, especially when it comes to the disadvantaged black population that had to endure its decline. Yet, it also provides a great deal of information from which we can learn. The Pruitt-Igo Urban Renewal Project should be reflected upon as a prime example of stark differences between expectations and reality. The federal funds allocated to the project were expected to be sufficient, when, in reality, they led to changes that aided in Pruitt-Igo's eventual failure. This is directly correlated with the expectations concerning planning the project, where Yamasaki envisioned an open community with a fantastic standard of life, but which was doomed to become a constricted, drab living environment. The expectations concerning race are more complex. Though we cannot get behind the expectations of legally segregated housing, we can see the ways that white flight and a lack of demand led to a naturally segregated living community. The interiors of the buildings were expected to be architectural marvels with efficient features and quality interiors. Yet, there were actually interiors with inefficient features such as the skip-stop elevators and interiors which weren't built to last. pruitt was expected to remain, an image of positive urban renewal. Yet, today a majority of the land pruitt once occupied remains unused and underdeveloped. 
and so it is best to hope that, at the very least, the legacy of Pruitt-Igoe can translate into more carefully planned housing projects, whether they be public or private, that better account for reality than the creators of Pruitt-Igoe did.